Well, as everyone knows, today is Father's Day, and uh, how many of y'all got an ugly tie, or perhaps, a, I don't know, a, a contraption from Sharper Image or something? But that's not what it's all about. Today, uh, today we celebrate the not just our earthly fathers, but our heavenly father. And uh, so many times we we look and then. And we, we wonder what that role is. If, we, uh, if you'll open up your, your Bibles to Genesis chapter 17. And we're going to start with verse 15. Now I'm reading from the King James. Uh, so I don't know if I'll always read from the King James, but today I'm reading from and God said unto Abraham, As for Sarah thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarah, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her, and give thee a son also for her. Ye, I will bless her, and she will be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face, and laughed, and in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And Abraham said unto God, O oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son intended, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him. For an everlasting covenant with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him. And I will make him a fruitful, and I will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes he shall beget. And I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee. At this set time next year. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for that reading, Lord. May we take it to heart. May we investigate the meaning. May we look at the, the deeper understanding of, of what that is saying. May we look at how it connects to the text after it, Lord. And get a better understanding of your holy word, Lord. As we search for you, give us the discernment and the understanding of your holy word and how to use it and apply it to our lives. Lord, we thank you for the gifts that you have given us and we thank you for the gifts that we have not yet realized. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So many people talk about what a father is. A lot of people, which is true, the father is the spiritual head of the household. However, there's a lot of houses without fathers now, right now. Uh, a lot of people look at the father as the breadwinner. As a disciplinarian, there's many things that you can apply to a father. But more than anything, the father is your example. The father is, is who we find most of the time we model our lives after. I'm going to give you a few examples today. The first one is my father. My father was an alcoholic. I saw no problem with that, so I dabbled in that. I became a drug addict. There's a definite correlation there. But my father was not a terrible man. My father loved us very much. He just had a problem. He was smart, too. He was smart. He had two masters in engineering, one in mechanical, one in civil engineering. He worked for companies, and, and then he'd, he'd get up there, but then he would lose that job because they'd realize the problem that he had. So, so although... He had that problem. He still had some other qualities that I was able to pick up on. One of those qualities is work ethic. My dad eventually succumbed to alcohol. He died of uh, renal failure, complete renal failure. Kidneys and liver shut down. My mother found him in the bathroom. But what he was doing in that bathroom was he was getting ready for work. He was in his 60s. He could have had that job, engineering. He could have been making 
hundreds, thousands of dollars. But his affliction kept him from doing that. However, every day he went into that bathroom and he put on a little blue shirt that said Food City right here. And he went out in the hot sun and he got carts so that he could put food on the table for my mother. He looked over being prideful. He could have been prideful and said, you know what, I'm not a buggy getter, I'm an engineer. I'm going to wait on that engineering job. But he did. He set that example for me. And I, I love that man for that. Incredible. Incredible. The one thing that I wish that he did do, though, that we didn't have, is we didn't have the Lord in our house. We didn't have God. I found out later, years later, after his death, that my mom actually used to go in her room and pray and read the Bible every single day. But she didn't share it with us because that wasn't my dad's wishes. So I became calloused to the Bible. I became a doubter. I, I, I did study scripture, but I studied it for the wrong reasons. I did reverse apologetics. I argued against the Bible, not for the Bible. So I was uh, one of one of its worst enemies, I guess, in that in that fashion. The other thing um, that he taught me, so we're going good, bad, good, bad, good, bad, is he taught me how to be sociable. My dad, if you walked into that room, he was it. He was the life of the party. People loved him. People loved him. He just had something about him that would draw you to him. I hate to think that I'm not going to see him again. But I don't know. That's a horrible thing to carry around. I don't know if he knew Jesus Christ. I know that when he was in a coma, the pastor from my sister's and my mom's church came to talk to him. And, but I, I don't know what he understood. I don't know why he didn't want to know the Lord. I don't know why he didn't want his kids to know the Lord. I don't know these things. These are things that are left unknown. But that's an earthly father. We can't expect perfection out of an earthly father. Because <laughs> there's no one on earth that is perfect. It's impossible. If you look in the mirror and you think you are perfect, you're wrong. You're wrong. As a matter of fact, if you look in the mirror and you think that you're close to perfect, you're wrong. I'm not trying to tear you down. I look in the mirror and I see the same thing. I know that I will never attain perfection. I know that I will never be where I need to be. And it took me a long time to realize that about my dad. It took me a long time to realize that there were certain things that I had to forgive him for, just like Christ forgives me every single day. So many things. Now there's another example. Woo! <laughs> this one's tough. We wouldn't have this church if it wasn't for Nikki's dad, Wayne. As a matter of fact, I'm reading from uh, the Bible that they gave me the day that I got saved. I said, Scotty, we love you, son, son. And we pray that God bless you, all of us. Love, tree, and wife. That's true. But uh, <laughs> he became a father to me. He became an example. He was a man of faith. As a matter of fact, he even had business cards made that said man of faith. Didn't say his name, didn't say anything, just said man of faith and a phone number. If you need faith, call 1-800-FAITH-MAN. <laughs> but he lived it too. He lived it. He lived it up until the day he died. He prayed. Man, he prayed. Sometimes our faith takes over. Sometimes our faith, we want to push we want to push, we want to faith God into doing what we want to do. 
We want to faith Him into doing our bidding. Wayne prayed for, for healing. Unfortunately, he didn't get it. But that wasn't God's will. That wasn't God's will. We can't pray God's will. We can pray to God for His will to be done. But we can't pray for our will to become God's will. But man, he had strong faith. He had such strong faith. He was also a genius. He has these notepads from the 70s. Al Gore didn't invent the internet. Wayne Duff did. I'm serious. He has had, well, you, you still got it. Yeah, he, he was good at anything. But he had zero college education. So here's, you know, let's do the comparison. My father, who had two masters in engineering, her father, who had just a, a high school education, started a software company, learned how to program on his own, and now has a, a program that almost every single insurance agent around this area and around this region uses to create their forms when we get insurance. And they have to renew it each year. Pretty smart. Residual income. And he was frugal and he was smart with his money. And he tithed. He used to teach on tithing. He used to teach on, on, on giving and what giving would bring back to you. But he didn't give because he wanted something back. He gave because that's what the Lord laid upon his heart. He used to ride around and buy people meals, pick up hitchhikers, and then give them tracks. And while they were in the car, he would sit there and talk to them about the Lord. In a moving vehicle, you're trapped. You got to hear it. You got to hear it. <laughs> Unless you're really brave. Unless you're really brave. I've jumped from one. It's not fun. Not fun at all. But one of the things that, that, that Wayne did in his, in his drive, his drive took over there for a while. He was a workaholic. He, he engulfed himself in work. And, 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 and work became the biggest part of his life. And, and there towards the, the end of his life, the last few years, he realized that. He stepped back and he, he reconnected with his family. And that's something that the Lord laid on his heart. So, you know, even as, as like I said, there's no perfect person. We, we can't expect perfection. But we can mend relationships. We can always go back and say, I'm sorry. Now, someone may not accept that sorry. And that's, that's fine. That's on them once they don't accept the, the, the sincere apology. But when you apologize to the Lord, it's accepted. We've been told that we were forgiven past, present, and future sins. That doesn't give us the right to go out and do whatever we want to do. It doesn't give us the right to go out on... Uh, I mean, like some of these crazies are today, and, and do destructive things to society or, or to, to, to intentionally hurt people. It doesn't give us those rights. But what it does do is it gives us that safety net when we mess up. We all know that when we accept Jesus Christ into our hearts that we have a life change. Not everything's going to change at once, but we have a life change. We have things that surprise, that surprise ourselves. And all of a sudden, we're doing things that we thought we would never do. And it's because before He left this earth, Jesus Christ told us that He was going to leave us the Holy Spirit to guide us. And man, sometimes that Holy Spirit is a nag. <laughs> I mean, I feel guilty a lot. <laughs> But, you know what? It was left there out of love so that we could do the things that He wants us to do. I want to talk about another earthly father. If you'll turn to Genesis chapter 22. Now remember this first verse that we read, okay? About, about Sarah and about Abraham and about Isaac and how, how God was going to build a nation out of Isaac. Chapter 22, we're going to start with verse 1. And this is going to be rather long. It's going to go to, to 13. But it's important that we hear how this works, okay? And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, 
And he said, Behold, I am, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son, Isaac, whom you lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah. Offer him there as a burnt offering upon the mountains of which I will tell thee. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw a far off place. Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. He took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac <coughs> spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God told them of. And Abraham built an altar there, laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, and took his knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, Here I am. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and the offering and offered him up for a burnt offering in the steed of the sun. In that first verse that we read, God tells Abraham, I am going to make a great nation out of Isaac. <coughs> if we look back here at verse 5, chapter 22. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you. Isaac and Abraham went up that mountain together, two people. And Abraham knew the two people were coming back. That's faith. That's faith. And that wasn't always Abraham's strong point. I wasn't always Abraham's strong point. Think back to Egypt when he, he lied and said that, that, that Sarah was his sister and, and the Egyptian king took her. You know, if it wasn't for God's grace, he would have never gotten her back. Think about Hagar who gave birth to Ishmael. Now, when they describe that, they say that, that, that Hagar sat upon Sarah's lap and delivered the baby. And in those days they did that because if one of your slaves delivered a child while they were in that position, you took possession of that child. So that Ishmael was technically Sarah and Abraham's child. But that's not who the Lord wanted to build the nation out of. He wanted to build the nation out of Isaac. And he had told that to Abraham. When we read that verse, I know that everyone's like, goodness he must have been sweating bullets he, he oh gosh Abraham he had no idea Abraham knew Abraham knew if, if he went up there and he came back without Isaac God would have been a liar and that's impossible God can't lie to us that's the only thing he can't do he can do anything but lie to us he is truthful with us he is completely open with us he holds nothing back from us. All of His riches are available to us once we accept His Son. But this story right here is so amazing because look at the, the, the faith 
that he had. He walked up there with the wood, the knife, and he was ready to do it. And he was like, my God, if, if I have to kill my son, God's going to raise him. Because we're both coming down this mountain. He knew the power of God. And us, as fathers, we have to transmit that to our families. We have to transmit our love of God. Our understanding of Jesus Christ. Our understanding of the Bible. We have to share that with our families. We have to be the example. We can't be silent. That is our job. To do that. And we are following the example of the Heavenly Father. If you would turn to Luke chapter 22. See, I'm not going to rush. I'll let y'all get there. <laughs> no, I'm good. I've got a... Not enough. All right, as, our, as, a, as we get into these verses right here, I want you to remember and think about what our Heavenly Father did for us. And let's not just celebrate our earthly Father today. Let's celebrate our Heavenly Father. Luke chapter 22, starting with verse 40. And when he was in the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye not enter into temptation. And he was drawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto, to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And the sweat was it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. That's an actual condition. It's an actual condition of stress, an actual condition of, of, of uneasiness, of, 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 of impending doom how hard is it to say no to your kids everyone wants to give their kids what they want I mean my goodness go to a Toys R Us God said no God said no he said I'm not going to take this away from you I'm not going to do it because I want to save each and every one of these people. You're the only thing that can save them. So I'm not going to say yes. I'm not going to give you what you're asking for this time, son. And God, who sees all things, looks down from heaven and he sees his son getting beaten Beaten to a pulp. If you if you ever truly look at the, the science behind it, the Romans were just cruel. They were just cruel. But the cat of nine tails would, would pull the skin away from, from the bone and, and bone would be showing. Most people didn't make it through the, the scourging. Most people didn't make it through the beating to get to the crucifixion. Most people died from the shock. The thorny crown when it was pressed upon his head, that's some of the worst pain that a human can feel. All your sensory nerves and everything tied in right here. And it's just, it, it's just unbearable pain. And, and here's a father, a heavenly father nonetheless, who is sovereign, who, who is all-knowing, who, who could put a stop to this, looking down at his son enduring this, for us. For us today. And I'm just going to 
just want to read this uh, this next verse to you. It's now from it's it's Jesus' crucifixion, and it says, "Now from the sixth hour there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour, and in the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, My God, My God, why hast thou forsaken me?" God had to turn away from him, not because of what he was seeing as far as the crucifixion, not because of what he had seen as far as his son getting beat, but what he was having to endure by absorbing and taking on all of our sin. That is what our Heavenly Father has done for us. So let's, let's celebrate Him today as well as our earthly fathers because both earthly fathers and our Heavenly Fathers deserve to be celebrated. Especially the earthly fathers that are teaching those lessons to their children. But let's never forget the gift that we have been given. The gift of eternal life. The gift of salvation. That we would not have been able to obtain if it was not for our Heavenly Father. Giving up His Son. Think about how much you love your kids. Think about that. I mean, I, I love my son. I don't get to see him as much as I want to, but I love my son. And if I even heard about something happening to him, it would tear me to pieces. Much less having to witness something happening to him. And his love for us is unconditional. That's something that we on earth or incapable of. We cannot love unconditionally. We can say we love unconditionally. But I think every single one of us here has fallen out of love once or twice and we know that there's no such thing as unconditional love. Unless it's coming from our Heavenly Father. Unless it's coming from Jesus Christ. Unless it's coming from the Holy Spirit. Only source of unconditional love is God.